Okay. You want to use the mic? Uh, I'm see. Can everybody hear me okay if I don't use a mic? All right. Can I give you some indigestion? We'll get started while I go. Work? All right. Uh, I'll tell you what. I'm going to try it without the mic. If you can't, can't hear me, give me sign language or something. You're looking dazed. Can you hear me? Well, there's a lot of background noise right now. How about that? Is that better? Yeah. All right. All right. I'm going to try it with the mic. We'll try that. All right. <laughs> For those of you that don't know me, I'm Steve Murray. So I'm going to talk tonight on uh, cross country and across the country uh, GA flight planning. Jay Jones, he said he'd help me if he could if he wasn't out traveling. He does a lot of travel in his uh, uh, beach craft. I think it's a Sierra or Sundown that he's got here. And he actually went over to Raleigh tonight. And he said he had a huge tailwind. And because of that, the headwind coming back, he probably wouldn't make it tonight. So Jay Jones is helping in Constantia here. So what I'd like to go through, maybe, is uh, go through route, uh, route planning, some weather planning. And, and to me, that's kind of the most challenging step. We'll go through fuel stop planning and then uh, flight following. And every place you see this in blue is I'm going to try to sell you on flight uh, flight follow tonight. But Ricky, you can jump in here anywhere you want on this stuff if you agree or disagree. Oh, yes. And then we'll have a list of some web links here. So what this presentation is based off my very limited experience, and it's all in small GA aircraft. I've not done any large GA complicated aircraft. Um, I typically do do a cross country every month or so. Uh, I'm going to try to illustrate some of this. I've done uh, four cross countries across, across the U.S., over a period of about 25 years. And I've seen a lot of changes in the way I do it and uh, kind of what's going on there. So I thought that would be a good vehicle to kind of share some of the changes since I uh, started doing this. Um, so I'll try to highlight some of the technological differences in flight planning, like I say, between when I started to fly in 1980 and today. So if you look at, probably a few of you recognize that. I know Mike, you mentioned that we're gonna hear about an E6B. I do remember that on the flight test. I don't remember how they did, but if you think about that, really the only thing we were doing that for was really to give us a wind correction and to give us an airspeed, right? What we thought our ground speed would be. That's all we used that for. And we use that for fuel planning, right? And so those are the things of what we use that. So you fast forward a little bit, right? <laughs> now you've got a box that will give you your location to within a meter of two. Um, it'll give you ground speed, which is what we were trying to do with this, and will give you, what, a desired track and everything, right? And, and most, a lot of people today have very accurate fuel flow. We were working on Alex's the other day, and Mark and him were driving me crazy. They were worried about like a 2% error in fuel flow. <laughs> I mean, yeah. So, I mean, you're getting down to that kind of level. And then you also have uh, cockpit weather and traffic now as well. So the, the changes are, are quite a bit here. And I'll talk about, I think this has changed the way we plan flights, and I don't think all of it's for the better. So, and I'll kind of use example, like when I use Google Maps these days, I can go some places, but I really don't have an awareness of where I'm at, and kind of, I'll call it a situational awareness, okay? What is the next interstate over or where I'm at? And I think I've migrated to some of this as well because of using that GPS, just going point to point. I don't really get out the sectionals. And I'll talk about some of that today when you do flight planning, at least what I do to kind of avoid that, because I don't, I don't think it's all for the better. So during the presentation, I think speak up and, and tell us about the apps that you use or tips that you use, or more importantly, the things you say, hey, look, don't do this, because I, you know, this is just for my limited experience. I'll take any help we can get on this. Okay, still I'll put down here the VFR, that go, no-go decision for long cross countries. And I'm not talking to 50 miles, but when you're venturing out you're going to a new area, or you're going out a couple hundred miles, or you're going out a couple hundred miles, and you're going to be coming back a day or two later, and you're looking at weather. Those, are, to me, are some of the hardest decisions to make uh, for flight planning. It's, it's primarily around the weather. But it's getting easier. It's much better weather analysis, and we'll talk about some of that. I'm going to use that term weather analysis versus weather data, and we'll explain some of that. So cross-country uh, route planning. So navigation has changed you know, dramatically over the years. We talked about that. You know, if you left the sectional chart, I, I learned to, to fly what's called L.A., Lower Alabama. And so if you left the sectional chart, that's like, you know, Columbus going over the horizon. Like, is there something beyond this sectional chart? I mean, I, I don't know what's out there. 
right? And the, and the charts were always expired. My dad made sure he bought one every four or five years. And then, the, the, you know, remember the, the, the uh, AFD book? It was all tattered, the little paper, the thin paper, like toilet paper. And that was always torn up. So when you couldn't do it anymore. And then, you know, it all started when you went to the FBO. Remember they had that wall, a big map on the wall? Sorry about that. I don't know what this is doing that. Uh, but they had that big, uh, let me get back, if I can. Just me jiggling this. <laughs> Don't touch it. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so let me, we'll try to not move my hand and do this again. So it started with that radius string on the wall, right? And you kind of laid that out, and you laid it across the VORs, and it came back and it told you how far away it was. And that's kind of how you started all the flight planning when I was there. That's what you did. You sat there. And then you, you got out there, and you were drawing lines uh, from two VORs. And you're sitting in the cockpit, and you said, okay, I'm on 100-degree radio on this one, and 50-degree. And you're drawing a line on that old chart, and there's so many lines on it. The chart was cracking on the piece of paper. And that's kind of how you navigated around. Because I didn't have... You know, I think RNAV was coming out in the late 70s where you could use kind of like two VORs and create some virtual stuff, but I never had any of that. So, and remember the printed, this was the, the key, it's like having a Granger catalog or an aircraft spruce catalog. If you had the air, the AOPA airport directory with that printed out, I see a few blank stares and hear people going like, what the hell is that? <laughs> but most of you remember that, right? You had the printed version of that and that was worth its weight in gold. And you did navigation, again, was VOR to, VO, to VOR versus what they call area navigation. So you literally went, not point to point, because today you go point to point with GPS, but you went from this VOR to the next VOR to the next VOR, and then you did a little bit of dead reckoning or you shot a radio off of it, and that's how you did. And so I think there was, you know, when you do this now, there was, there was a, a loss of cognitive thinking when we got away from that, because you're not really looking at where you're going anymore. You're just putting in two points, and I think there's some danger to that. So I'm going to show of hands here on this part. Now, who has used the following navigation methods? Four course radio range. Oh, look at that. So tell us, a, I mean, how did that work? I know nothing about that. I've seen it, but. Did, AM. Huh? Dot dash. Dot 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 dot. Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> Is it, was it worse than NDBs? All right. So that, how about Celestial? Who's done Celestial? I thought some of the airlines did that across country a long time ago. Um, ADF, NDBs. Look at that, only half the hands. Look at that. Wow. Okay. Who could pass a check right on one of those these days? <laughs> now, how many times did you use NDB and you listened to the game on the AM radio? Okay. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Okay. Who did the one where you follow the road and then fly around the circle of the town and look for the... Yes, yeah, see? That's a lower Alabama technique. I know that one. So find the water tower. VORs. I think everybody's got a VOR, right? Right? Who now owns a plane without a VOR in it? Me. Yeah, me. Yeah, look at that. Wow. Okay. DME. That was high-tech shit there. Look at that. Inertial. Uh, Oh, you guys that flew for a living. There you go. Loran? Yeah. In my boat. Yeah. <laughs> I'll talk about that in a minute. That got me into trouble there. Right? And GPS. Everybody's got that one, right? Okay. All right. So what other ones? Is there anything out there? Anybody else is using light signal stuff on the ground? Leo? Smoke signals. When I first started flying, my chart said, Holy Roman Empire. <laughs> Cross country to across the country. I say the biggest difference, I think, cross country and going across the country to me is weather, right? It's just that you've got to do some more planning for that. And in you're flying typically over sequential days and you're covering a lot more ground and you're probably going to be crossing some fronts. And to me, that's where the challenge starts to happen on that one. And then mountain flying, especially if you're going in a low-powered aircraft, and this is what I had out in Utah for many years, it gets to be more of a challenge learning to fly in the mountains if you've only got 150 horsepower at sea level. And then I, I would say, make sure your plans are flexible. That old adage that you know, you got time to spare. This is when you want to go the cross country. So I'll start, I'll show my first cross country. This was the family airplane. We had this for about, we had it total about 30 years, about 20 years when I took it out, out west. So did that and take a look at this fancy avionics stuff. Got that King radio. You can barely see that there, right? And that's going to drive the mighty VOR. Now I didn't know that in Alabama that, you know, three or 4,000 feet is not high altitude out in New Mexico, <laughs> Utah, which is this story I'll pick up here in a minute. And then I had a Loran, and that got me into trouble because I started using that 
going area navigation, right? You put in, you literally type in a six digit longitude, six digit latitude and off it would take you, right? It was a miracle and he gave you a ground speed. So that was a thing, it was just wonderful, right? And so I thought when I did this, hell, I can get anywhere with this thing, right? We'll get out there. So the story will continue here, right? So this is the first cross country airplane. So it's the first time uh, I went across the country. It's July, 1997, I have not flown in 13 years. So I went and got a BFR. Ah, what's going on? There? And I got a BFR done, and I got about an hour or two of mountain flying. Right, so I'm good to go. So my dad now, I salute my dad. My dad was born in 1922. He flew before World War II, crashed the plane, and didn't start flying again until 1970s. But he really wasn't into detailed flight planning. He liked planning, and he was really good stick and rudder. But again, I learned to fly in Alabama, and now I live in Utah. So this is what he's going to do. I took a commercial flight, Birmingham, Alabama, right? I'm going to meet my dad. I should have thought through this. I didn't. So 22 hours in a small plane with my dad from Alabama to Utah. And this trip starts with I get out, and my dad, again, he's not huge into the planning, but he's got a Prestone jug. I told this story to Alex the other day. He's got a Prestone gallon yellow, yellow jug, right? And I'm thinking, whatever, I take off, and my dad pulls out his pocket knife. You know, and he was born with a pocket knife. I think the pocket knife came out first, and my dad came out when he was born. So he sits there and starts trimming that bottle. I'm like, what are you doing? He says, well, it's going to be a long flight. i got to pee a lot, and they the tip of this bottle is pretty sharp. So, like, oh, really? so the, the smell of pressed stone in urine for the next 22 hours, I still have not gotten over that. So we did not do the proper flight planning. And so that plane there, so I get into it, that Cherokee, right, right? And the the uh, compass is half full of kerosene. So, you know, it's a bobblehead, right? It's not it's not going to hold any course at all. And what I don't know about the Loran, because I didn't think about it, is it's the 1980s. This thing has a range for Loran. It picks up like four or five radio signals. And they're based off, there's some in the East Coast, there's some in the central part of the U.S., and there's some in the West Coast. Well, guess what happened about this point in time? The radio signals go off, right? So there's no more navigation use at Loran. I got to get back to the VOR. And guess what happens out here? You know, when you're, you know, the, you're about six or 7,000 feet and I'm flying about 1,000 feet of ground, there's no VORs and the bobblehead compass. So the last thing we had here at this point was like a United Airlines calling, you know, Cherokee 55402, are you up? Flight service is trying to get in touch with you guys. <laughs> so we ended up parking here. I was tired of that, my dad, and I came back a week later and drove and finished up the trip. So that was my first <laughs> cross-country flight planning there. So it was a long trip. Okay, so uh, I've got a few of you already asked me about some of the resources that we use, I think, that are out there today. So. Many of the web-based uh, apps uh, are great for looking at sectionals and for route planning. There's a bunch of them out there. I used to use the AOP app. I've not used that in a while, so I can't speak to that. I know Floor Flight, I hear a lot of people talking about that. I've used some Wing X. Uh, Flightplan.com is one I use today a lot. Sky Vector. There's a lot of them out there for just doing, for picking point to point look at it. Now, what I would encourage you to do here are some of the other techniques when you get ready to do that. So almost all these apps, you're able to view sectional charts, the IFR charts, approach charts. What I have found is it's very difficult to look at the, you know, the legends on the front and the back that you have on the sectional charts that list all the MOA, the MOA hot times and the frequencies. That data is very hard to get to what, what I have found on a lot of these applications. So they're very good, I think, for looking at charts, but that detailed data, especially on the legend, I find it very hard to get to. Uh, on that. And especially, I've not found it a way when I use my EFIS how to get that in flight at all. So that's a downside. The AOPA airport directory, the famous printed one, that's now available online and a membership is not required. Uh, so you can get to that. And it's got all the airport facility directory data. And a lot of these other flights, uh, I think uh, Sky Vector and Nav Monster is another one I'll talk about. A lot of those have that data out there as well. And then I find a lot of times the online comments are sometimes useful that you know, maybe the FBO at Jackson Hole is not gonna to cater to a Cherokee 140. They're more interested in the G5 or whatever it is. But you'll see kind of, you know, is this an airport I wanna to go to or not? So I found some good comments on that. Um, so I typically use these apps and then I zoom in and slowly pan across them to good look and see what's out there. You know, are there restricted areas? Are there MOAs? I typically wanna stay away from class B and C airports as much as I can. Uh, are there large bodies of water? And we'll talk about why some of this is mountainous terrain, kind of what's out there. And again, this is what I talked about. Don't just pick one point, start and finish and let the app do it. You really should be looking at those charts to see what you're flying over and what you're gonna be doing. 
And again, most of the sites will give you recommendations for altitude based off the winds aloft, which is very helpful, right? From the E6 kind of days, it just gives that to you. So here's some route planning considerations. This is a route I typically fly uh, every month. It's, it's from here over to central Alabama to go see my mother-in-law. So it seems kind of straightforward, right? Go zero alpha seven and go direct. What, what do I need to do? Let's just go do that. So, well, are there some things we should consider? So we'll, we'll kind of take a look at this here in a second here. Let me see if I can do this here. Do you want to fly over mountainous terrain? And, and I am a chicken shit about this stuff here. So I've, I've had two unscheduled landings in my life. So I know, it, you know it's going to happen sometimes. But when you, when you look at this, if you fly direct for about the first 20 or 30 minutes, there's not a lot of landing spots up here. And so the, when you have the first problem when the engine stops, that's great. You, get, you work on that. And then you got a second problem about where I'm going to land because there's another problem coming at you really quick. So I typically fly this route here on the bottom, and it adds for me about 20 nautical miles to it. And so I've just gotten to where I do that. So I go straight, I get out of the mountains, and then I ride along the escarpment. And what I found coming back, the weather is always a lot more benign when I come back along the outside of that escarpment. And then I can zoom in, and there's a lot of places here to land. So I can kind of get in close to Asheville up in this area here, and there's a lot of airports that I know. There's Kickens, Tacoa, all those options there. So as you pick your flight plans out there, I would encourage you not to go just pick direct, but really look at what's underneath you. What are you flying over? Uh, again, uh, living out in Utah for a while, do you want to go over water? So we have the Great Salt Lake, which I think is almost gone these days, so it's maybe not a problem. But So do you want to go over water? How about really cold water? So that engine stops, now you land in the water, and you got about 15 minutes to live because that water is so cold. So really think about that. Uh, I, I used to go up to Baltimore a lot. My son was up there, and I hated they'd route me out over the water all the time. And I just... I don't like going over the water. Again, I want to I want to have a problem in the air and then not have a problem when I get to the ground. Um, I like to stay clear of restricted areas, Class B airports. Um, decide about the MOAs, and, and many are cold during the weekends. And when you see this blue, this is me selling flight following. If you're using flight following, typically I found ATC will let you know, hey, this MOA up there is hot. Do you want to go through it or do you not? or won't even talk to you if you want to go through it. But they typically have that information. So again, another plug for using flight following on that. Also low ceilings. Uh, maybe what you want to do is hop airport to airport, because I've done several runs, and I'm not going to recommend you do scud running, but if you've got a solid maybe 2,000 foot ceiling and you want to fly at 1,000 feet, maybe hop airport to airport. And you know what? That fancy gee whiz navigator you got there makes that, I'll call it easy peasy. You just load in a bunch of 20 mile flights across there and you've always got a turnaround spot a few minutes to go back to. So that's one of the other things I do if there's low ceilings and I'm a little bit nervous about that, I'll load in a bunch of airports. The only thing I need to do is turn around and hit direct and I'm right back to, to where I want to go. Um, the other one is check those NOTAMs. I know we fly out of here a lot. I flew in one time when it was NOTAM closed. John had a motorcycle event going and so I, that's the first time I've known that I've flown into a closed airport. Um, but the FAA's got a good NOTAM uh, search site out there. You just type it in and they'll pull those up. Um, not all of the EFASs are showing airport NOTAMs. I think the tablet-based ones are better at that, the ones that are constantly downloading data before you walk out to the airport. I think they're better. And I'll talk a little bit about it. I know on my Dynon it is not showing uh, fire TFRs all the time, which is a problem. So now you've got that route picked out, you're going to fly the route. If you've got the EFIS and the tablets, you know, it replaces the need for a lot of paper chart and AFDs. And back in the day, you know, I flew with a lot of expired charts when I was learning to fly because they just weren't there and usually had to fly to the next area to buy the next chart because it wasn't available at the little, you know, uh, Alabama airport. <laughs> Sorry, let me turn that off. Uh, the use of the moving maps, to me, that is such a huge situational awareness. I think, you know, I'd say you've lost some of the situational awareness because you haven't paid attention to flight planning, but knowing exactly where you're at all the time is a huge, huge benefit there. And so for those that, that uh, are not flying with one, I would recommend get you an iPad and, and get something that shows a moving map. It's a really big situational awareness thing. So the ADS-BN, I mean, that is such a huge improvement during the flight. And you, you've got the overlay of traffic to me, which is a huge thing. I'm amazed how much traffic I see on ADS-BN on the screen, and I never see it outside the window, even looking for it. I just don't see them. So I, I just can't imagine the airports out there. 
Uh, you get the overlay of the next rad weather. I'm flying now things I would never do in the past. I don't think it's safer, but I just, I get a lot more data in the past. I would have sat on the ground, but now I can see stuff up there that I couldn't see and I can stay 20 or 30. I'm confident I can stay 20 or 30 miles away from weather and go do that. The METAR data, I went with Al, um, Mark uh, out to the coast last week to the East coast. And you know, five, 10 minutes after you take off, you can pick up the METARs for where you want to go to. So the data, having that data right there, and you can sit there and say, okay, the fog's burning off. You can check it every 15 minutes and see the METARs, what the winds are doing, everything. So that's just a huge benefit to be able to do that. Uh, most of the uh, tablet-based apps will auto upload your plan route from EFIS into Bluetooth. I don't really use that a whole lot. I'm only using usually flight plans with three or four waypoints, but if you do have a lot of waypoints, a lot of the tablets these days, you, you, you know, fix them at home and they'll upload straight into your EFISs in your airplane. Uh, again, here's that caution I talked about. Some of the EFISs are not showing fire TFRs. Uh, not sure, but I think the tablet-based apps, again, are more real-time than what the EFISs are doing. I don't understand it. I have read what um, the FAA is providing via the ADS-B link, and I think some of it should be there. But from what I read online, it's not always there, especially for some of the files for the short, short inversion ones. Again, I'll sell again, if you're on flight following, you may get a reminder if you're getting ready to fly in the ones. And again, another benefit of that flight following, I had one out in Montana about a month or two ago, it was not showing up on my EFIS. That's how I figured out they weren't showing up. And he said, hey, are you aware of that TFR? It's out there. Okay, so here's my second one. I went from North Carolina to uh, SoCal, up to John Wayne Airport. Uh, so those are, that's, um, Everybody here kind of know where John Wayne, I know you do, Sid, yeah. So anyway, we did that, and I, um, I'm sorry about that. This is what you get for not having a professional presenter here. So I, I did this trip with my brother, and he flew corporate for like 30 years. He flew for VF Corporation, did Falcon 50s, and it was a huge, uh, I really enjoyed the trip, and it really pointed the difference to me about the difference between GA flying and corporate flying on there. So the first thing he did is says, well, how far are we gonna go? And I was like, Mike, we're we gonna go till we get hungry, till we have to pee. That's that's kind of our range. That's what we're gonna do. Well, where you know, where are we gonna cross the Rockies? I said, Michael, we can't get over the Rockies in this thing. You know, we can't do this. But it was a lot of fun. But you know, yeah, his ability to look at weather, the you know, having somebody who does this for a living, listen to him talk to ATC, it was just a I learned a lot with that. It was a lot of fun. This was the first time too I flew with GPS. I had a whopping Garmin 196, right? But it's got it's got airport numbers in there, links. You know, it's got data, elevations. I mean, it was just, wow, what a difference that made being able to do that. It showed restricted areas. Uh, again, it was just so much fun, and it was a good rejuvenation for my brother to, to get him uh, out from flying something to doing something he liked to do. So for fuel planning, so uh, cost and availability. Most of the apps now, the Four Flight, Wing X, and most of the online, online apps as well will show fuel pricing. I do think the portable apps are better because most of our EFISs, I think, do not show fuel pricing right now. Um, fuel planning has gotten a bit easier, I'll call it, because you've got now very accurate fuel flow in the cockpit. So in the past, you said, okay, my Cherokee's gonna burn eight hours. Okay, well, really it's burning, you know, 10 hours and takeoff and six hours in cruise. And you did a lot of averaging. Again, I think the data we saw on Alex the other day, you were like 2% you were fiddling with something. <laughs> It was, I mean, it was, the accuracy is just unreal. So you're able to cross check fuel burn with what you're seeing in the fuel gauges. So you can do that. And then because you've got very accurate location and ground speed, you're able to get much more precise fuel management. I know my EFIS today, it'll show me based on where you've got to the data point, how much fuel you're gonna have remaining. And so my, my rule is I do 10 gallons, so it's very easy to do that. So I think you're able to press on a lot further with some of the same or better safety margins than what we used to use. You know, so, get... so here is the, the, the amazing issue to me. With all this stuff we got, if you look at the accidents that are occurring, yep. it is running out of flipping gas. Yeah. <laughs> Go figure. Yeah. If you read GA News today, some guy passed over three airports to get to the last one because he was going to save 20 cents a gallon. Oh, no. yeah. He was short of Air Massachusetts by six miles, you know, once in a car. Yeah. And it's like, dude, but, and the other thing, you know, it's like if you're using the G1000, you, you know, you bet when you put the gas in, you better update the correct amount, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. But yeah, I mean, 
with all this, why do we keep running out of gas? Well, you know, the emphasis today, too, will, 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 you know, this looking, and if it says if you add a fuel, it'll say, do you add a fuel? Yeah. I mean, they're, yeah. you know, I can't answer that one, Mike, but I think. Yeah, I mean, there is no answer. <laughs> yeah. I think a lot of that's decision making, right? I mean, they've got the information, it's just decision making. Uh, so I'll show you an example here. Airnav.com does a nice job, I think, for optimizing the route versus fuel cost. Anybody else using any other thing? I mean, I, I used to use fly and leaded, but that's kind of died off uh, when I used to run the Subaru. Uh, so regardless of what app, I would definitely advise you call it advanced because I've gone to a few ones where the card reader doesn't work or, you know, whatever. We're out of fuel. So I would, if you're doing a long cross country, I would look it up on AirNav and then call them in advance. So if, if you haven't used AirNav, it's a free service online. You get in there, basically type in where you want to go from to, and then you're going to click, hey, look, I want to do plan a flight with fuel stops. And then, so I did Oshkosh, right? So this was as of yesterday. So it will show you like 10 routes here, and it says here's the distance. So this was one is 1% more in distance, and it's gonna say you get 26 bucks in fuel. And it kind of gives you a listing of the fuel. But that's a nice app on that. It's constantly updated. I found it to be pretty accurate. So and I've got these links at the end, but it's called airnav.com. They also have a lot of data on here if you wanna look at approach plates. And there's a lot of other stuff on there as well, but I primarily use that for- uh, You're in right? Uh, yes. Does this work? You can set it, there is a, um, a thing there where you can put mo gas here, but I have found that there's there's so few places have mo gas. I don't even fool with it anymore. I mean, I use it here all the time, but for cross country, I just use hundred low lead now. It used to be more, and that's where I think flyunleaded.com they had a map specifically for unleaded fuel. There was more. Yeah, it used to be more in the past. That's weird. Yeah, well, I think there's more places anyway. So that's uh, airnav.com. And that, that's a good rep. So here's my third one here. I changed the airplanes on this one. And this was going across the Sawtooth Mountains. And if you've never flown over those kind of mountains in G8, we'll get your attention. Every two seconds, you feel the engine rumbling and stumbling because there is no place to land out there in Idaho. Uh, this was on my bucket list when I built this plane was to fly into Johnson Creek. So I did this one, it was called a flycation. Actually, one of my sons was literally living in the woods out there. So I went to visit him. So weather planning. So this one to me is the hardest aspect to it. We'll talk some more about that here. Remember 1-800-WX-BRIEF. Some of us were talking about it tonight out there. I think today's online data is better than the flight stations. And I'll talk why I think of some of that. So if, if you look at the prod charts, um, there's a place called Area Forecast Discussion. Not the AFD, not the airport facility directory, but there's one called the Area Forecast. And I think that's one of the ones that's not used a lot so let me click on here, and I, this, I did this this morning, print it out. So you, you go to the area you want to look at, click on it, and so this is what's talking, this is the one for our local area. And if you haven't used it, it's a really nice overview. It kind of tells you what's going on with the weather for the day here. It's, it's a forecaster discussion, um, but just kind of tells you what's going to be going on. Gush should diminish by late afternoon, or early evening. Winds will gradually turn northwest. I mean, so it, it's a very simple, but it's a good uh, good point there to kind of see what, what uh, what's going on. So how, how do you get to that? Again? This is, and I'll have the link there, but it's under Aviation Weather Service, okay. and it's called the uh, Aviation Forecast Discussion. I'll have a set of links at the end, but that's one out there. Now, there, this website here is getting updated on the 16th of, the, of uh, October. Right? They've been running a beta version. Yeah. I'm not super excited about it, what I've seen, but anyway, that'll be updated. But yeah, the, the prog charts are going to be new also. Yeah, okay. Steve, if you use some fourth flight, you can go to the METAR yeah. the airport and, and that'll pop Oh, the front. Okay, nice. All right. You know, so the other thing you can use 1 800 weather brief. If, yeah. if you're staring at it and you've got it all in front of you yeah. and, and you're not sure, call them and call them up yep. and talk to the guy. I've not done that in a long thing. time. Yeah. That's a good thing for students yeah. to do is say, look, you know, it's all technology, but. You can learn a lot. Yeah. I used to enjoy going in when you had a flight service yeah. going in and talking to them. I mean, that was, it was good. Uh, so I'll say for cross country, you're not looking for the overall weather for the day, right? You don't want to know what the weather is in Asheville for the day or the weather in Cape Hatteras for the day. You want to know what is the weather when I'm going to be there, you know, for a two hour window or so. And that's different than what you'll see out there. So rather than looking for specific weather, you want to define path at a specific time. And I'll talk some out there. There's some apps out there now that will give you what is the weather going to look like as you do this cross country at the time you cross through the area? And you can look at it, you know, an hour or two or an hour before afterwards. So suggest using aviation specific sites. I'm going to show you some non-aviation sites, 
but I think the specific aviation sites, there's a couple of them out there, give you a better uh, look at the data. I will figure this out by the time this is over. Okay, so I'm not a fan of using uh, multiple, uh, I'll call it uh, TAFs, uh, I call them tiny area forecasts, because they're great, but they're really only looking at like five or 10 miles around the airport. So if you're, you know, if you're going here to Greenville, it's great, you got it covered, or going out 100 miles. But if you're gonna go two or 300 miles, it may be that there's a lot of gap 10 or 20 miles just outside that, that the weather is radically different than the terminal area forecast. Because again, I think those are the nickname for those are tiny area forecast. Um, I don't try to analyze the data. I can remember that, you know, taking the, uh, the, the test, that really drove me crazy. I just couldn't understand weather. So there's people out there that understand weather much, much better than I do. And so rather than taking that data and trying to develop a forecast, I'm gonna to try to use online tools and experts and understand what their forecasts are telling me. And there's a big difference here, and I'll show you on some of these websites here. Several sites show ceiling, visibility, turbulence, convective, wind forecast in an integrated fashion, meaning they'll show you all those at one time and what's going across. And there's a lot of them that don't do this. So pay attention to what forecast model the site you're using, and I'll show you some of these, like windy.com, you can click which forecast model you want to use. I find that the National Weather Service forecast to me is typically much more conservative than some of the others. But if you look at some of them, you'll start to compare them and say, well, look, they're saying 1,000 foot ceilings. This one's saying 2,000 foot ceilings, or this one's showing clear two or three hours earlier. So there's big differences out there depending upon which model that particular site you're using. So weather planning. So there's multiple apps that now feature what I call time-based sliders to view clouds, winds, and visibility over the route of your flight at various times of departure. I'm gonna to try to show you one of those. I'm trying to see if we can show you that live. So NOAA, uh, the a Aviation Weather Center, it's got good data. Their website, I think, is kind of clunky. It's not much integrated analysis. It's just lots of data out there. So if you wanna look at visibility, it's very good. And they have a slider where you can look at visibility over time. And then you can click and go look at um, cloud bases over time, but it's not all shown in one thing. You're clicking back and forth, trying to draw that picture of what you want in your mind. Again, new website coming out in a week or two. Windy.com, that one has got a lot of data. Probably a lot of your users have looked at windy.com. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of good data out there and they've got a full data set. I mean, cloud bases, visibility, winds, wave forecast, volcano, anything you want, they've got the data out there for it. They also have some sliders with the ability to look several days into the future but it's typically one parameter at a time. You're gonna be looking at cloud bases just at that point, or you're gonna be looking at wind or whatever, it may be visibility. It's not looking at all of it at one time, kind of what you wanna do on your flight, right? Because you can have great bases, but if there's a thunderstorm, you really don't wanna go. So you need to look at all that data at one time. So again, several forecast models are available on uh, Windy, but again, no integrated one for, for aviation. They've got a lot of aviation specific things, but there's not an integrated one. A nav monster, there's not much analysis. There's lots of data. It's great for local flying and there's lots of airport data on their website. It's very easy to use. I kind of like that one to play with. AOPA, I've not used them in a while. It used to be okay. Has anybody used AOPA lately? They used to have some kind of a little bit of integration on it. Okay, this is the one I use now and I'll try to show you this here. It's called EZWX Brief. Uh, I think, Brian, you're using it. Uh, I've talked to several other people who are using it now. And it's a guy called Scott Dinstad. He's up at Oshkosh a lot. Um, he uh, uh, used to work, I think, for uh, Four Flight and also worked, I think, for the National Weather Service. But he and his wife have started up this business. But it's very integrated, and it's only at aviation. It's a subscription service, but I, I find it quite worthwhile. Now, I'm going to try to jump over to this, and I'll show you what it looks like. All right, so this is looking at a flight I pulled up, uh, looking at Oshkosh. So what you've got down here is a slider, and you can slide your departure time. So I'll leave it two in the morning. So let's say we want to leave it eight in the morning. So it says, this is what's gonna be, have to be broken at 7,000, five miles, wind speed, four knots, this is here. But you can actually see what the cloud layers are supposed to be across time. Here's your freezing level as you traverse. So this is your flight plan down here. I just put in two, two start points, Zero Alpha 7 and Oshkosh, and it pulled it up. And so departing at eight o'clock, it says you're gonna start out here at marginal VFR. Here you're gonna have clouds broken at 11,000. So you can really see what's gonna go on in the flight. You say, well, my wife said she wants to sleep in. So what are we gonna do here? We're departing at 11 o'clock. You're still good. Now, if you scroll out here, we're gonna depart at three in the morning. Now, I wouldn't do that, but anyway. So you can see here, look what happens to the cloud layers, right? 
The other nice thing about this, this application here, it allows you to pick what's called personal minimums. So it, it really helps you with the decision making. So you can see for your personal minimums here, you click on this and it's going to show you if it's green. So it says, I have my departure ceiling set. If it's between 1,000 and 2,500, that's green for me. I've said that's a green thing for me. I'm not too worried about that. But in here it says in route ceiling is two to 3,000. I've got that down as a yellow for me. That's my personal minimum, what I selected. I am very scared of in route, in route convective potential. So there's something, none to low is what's green for me. This is red, so something's going on there. And you can go look and drill down, but it, it allows you to set your minimums and kind of look at what's going on. So that's clouds. It also, then you can click and see what, is it, what are the winds doing across time? Again, so you're looking at it across your area. You can kind of help you pick, what do you want to do over the next couple of days? What's my departure time? What's it look like? You've got the same thing for icing, which I usually, if there's anything on icing at all, I don't go. Turbulence. Now, I found this with turbulence. I found that to me does not seem to be a good forecast. I really don't run into forecast. Tur I don't hit nearly as much turbulence as I say there's going to be. Um, anyway, this is a site that it's, I'll call it very integrated. Weather Spork is another one that does that. AOPA used to do it. Again, I don't know if they're doing it now, but it, it allows you to take a look at all the things you're interested in in terms of visibility, ceiling heights, convective potential, winds in one site, and you can adjust the time around and say, can I go, can I not go? And it really gets to be good, again, if you're going to do a log cross country, right, four or 500 miles. And I'll show you some examples where I used this about a month ago, where the weather here was predicted to be pretty bad, but there was a nice time slot that opened up on it. So that's weather spork, or a, a DZWX brief, sorry. This is one I had pulled up, so we do that. So here's my fourth trip. I did this one about a month ago. My wife and I went out to Montana to see our son to, how do I say it, uh, Ravali, Ravali, Ravali. I was corrected on how to say that, so anyway. So this is the first time going across country with ADSB in weather and using this easy WX brief. And I guess I mentioned that go no no decision for me is one of the toughest ones for me to make. And this one's going to be one I was going to be flying seven or eight hours the first day and three or four hours the next day. And so crossing some fronts going across there. So we left zero alpha seven here on the left in the morning. And I knew there was going to be a lot of storms coming across. I can find my cursor here. Okay, we'll try to use the pointer. So I knew that coming across. Now this scale here is huge, right? It's 120 nautical miles. But I felt very comfortable having the ADSB in that we could keep track of these. And so these storms were gonna be washing across all during the day, took off. And we were originally scheduled to go up into here, but there's some stuff started brewing up here. And so again, using, able to use a lot of the data on, on board, uh, you know, with the EFIS, you've got all that airport facility directory now with you on, in your aircraft. We were able to redirect and go down to here. And using my wife's iPad, you could pick up fuel pricing as well. So we, so we redirected and went down to here. So this was the flight. I don't know when they tagged this. This is uh, from FlightAware, but you can kind of see what the flight is. So this weather tool, ADS and weather, I mean, that's a wonderful tool for doing cross countries. It really allows you. I would not have tried this flight without that on there. Again, it allows you to modify your, 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 your flight plans as you go. You've got NEXRAD, you've got Lightning. It's even got, if you go back up here on, you'll see, um, it's even pulling up PIREPS. You know, if people, you can see what other people are reporting as well. So I mean, just the amount of data out there as well. Again, being able to pull up the METARS to see what's going on out there at the airport you're gonna land at. And then also winds aloft, which is kind of nice, so. There's a lot of portable ADSB receivers out there today tied to tablets. I think they're anywhere from two or $300 up to a thousand, but that, a portable ADSB in receiver, and you can get all that data. All of it's free, there's no subscription, and it gives you traffic as well. So I would, I'm a big proponent of that. If you haven't thought about that, look at getting an ADSB in receiver. You can get a portable one and an iPad, and you can get all this data. It's really very helpful. So this is the second flight of the day. We left there, and you can see there's a little bit of storms here. So this one, again, using easy uh, WX brief, I can see we were gonna have about 200 miles, and there was gonna be about a thousand foot overcast. So I didn't wanna do that. So I actually filed IFR, climbed in severe clear, went on top 200 miles, and completely open. And I would not have felt comfortable doing that, just kind of staring out there or looking at all the data on the various weather sites by trying to figure out what it was. I had a tool that said, listen, Here's the cloud layer. This is how high it's going to be. This is the thickness. And you, you know, you climb up two or 3,000 feet and you're going to have it wide open all the rest of the day. So this is what we climbed up and over. This is my sleeping wife there. She is, uh, she's happy and happy. And this is coming out again, because just severe clear. And so in, I, I would have been really hard pressed to do that without some good 
I'll call it web-based flight planning tools. And then we stopped, got fuel, I checked that again. And then knowing that I can see what those storms are, if any of them are moving around using that in-flight weather. All right, so that's it on this. This is how I'm gonna start selling you now and why you should use flight following. And Ricky, I'll take any of your comments on this as well, since this is, you're on the back end of this. So um, I'll call it just safety, 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 safety for you and the other aircraft out there to me. Um, I do a lot of, not a lot, but once or twice a month, I'll take friends or whatever up and I go up and fly around Asheville. So I take, take off out of here. I go up uh, right along beside Asheville, go up to Asheville. I turn left, go across the mountains, fly down to Brevard and then fly back up there. And so I always call Asheville and talk to them because I figure it's going to be kind of rude if I kind of start flying around just outside their airspace and they don't know what I'm up to and anything else. And they're always very helpful when I go and do that. Um, so fess up, how, how many of you guys use flight following on a regular basis? 25%? All right. And again, I would say do this for 50 miles a year out, but if you're going someplace, I mean, if you're flying around Asheville, I would definitely use it because I, I want them to know and I want their eyes to look, look for me for traffic. Um, very easy to use. I find, I'll call it 95% of the controllers are very welcoming and helpful. On this last trip, I think we were over Kansas, I had a chatty controller. He was asking, how's your reception? A few minutes later, how's your reception now? I mean, he was just bored. So, I mean, I find they're very helpful. Um, if you were staying relatively low, the coverage could be spotty. And, and Ricky, any thoughts on that? Kind of what, is, what, what elevation do you need to be at around here to pick it up? In the Asheville area, um, uh, 65 to the west. But then if you're going out of the airspace, probably 8,000. Okay. For Atlanta Center. Yeah. I, I typically fly high, but I know when I, if you get down sometimes two, 3,000 feet, they're, it's hard to get them. Um, occasionally when they're really busy, you, they need to wait. Again, I've Memphis Center, some of those sometimes. And very occasionally I'll find they're not friendly or helpful, but that's, that's the rare exception there. I'll call it, it's almost free uh, collision and terrain avoidance as well. I've never had them call terrain on me, but they definitely call out traffic all the time, right? Um, and terrain, I have a feeling, Ricky, if we're going to fly into a mountain, would you guys ask us or say anything to us about that? Less likely VFR, but uh, certainly IFR. I'm <laughs> feeling the love. Depends on it. Yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll be watching. Yeah. But, but if, you're, if your whole mission is, is uh, you know, flying the canyons and stuff, we're kind of going you know, like to do what you want to do. Yeah, yeah. Um, I did see something. I see Mark and I went over uh, Charlotte. Of course, Charlotte never stay out of our airspace. We're rather never going to. So we went over the top, and I noticed they were calling out us as traffic to all the airlines, but they never talked to us about the traffic to the airlines. I, again, it seemed to be bi-directional love there. I wasn't getting that a whole lot there. I've flown over there because I have a son over there. They've yeah. been very helpful, but I just did flight following. I don't ask to go into class B, yeah. but a lot of times it was volunteer. Hey, oh, it's fine, you're clear to class B airspace. Really? Yeah. So I have never. I've asked and never. They've been good about that and, yeah. and also in, in pointing out a lot of traffic, yeah. including airliners that are... Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I could pick up that they were calling traffic because they were talking about an RV-10 at this, but, but I'm surprised they never told me to look for them. But anyway, maybe they just figured, anyway. But it, it's, and I think it's, it's, it's a good free service. It's a good safety thing to have that. If you ever have a problem, and I've had a problem one time while I was talking to them, you'll get immediate attention. Uh, Bill, you can maybe speak to this about confusion of ATC if they don't, when you have a problem, if they don't. Yeah, but I mean, if they know who you are, where you're going, and they've already got you on a squawk code, and, you know, you just say those words emergency, and I think you've got everybody's attention. Uh, and so, and they're going to reach you much faster, right? Especially once you get to the ground, they're going to know where you're at. I used them one time. I declared emergency and had to land. Uh, and within about 10 minutes, there was a state trooper at the airport. I mean, I was amazed. I mean, they really got people out there quick. So that's a huge, especially if you're out west in a lot of places or lower Alabama where there's just a lot of trees and not much things around. That's a huge thing if somebody knows where you're at. So I might, that's my final plea there is please, please use flight following. I think it's a, it's a benefit for the other pilots. They can hear you. It's a benefit, I think, for the air traffic control guys. If you're flying close to their area, they kind of know what you're up to versus just unverified. So, all right. So here's some of the links. I'll have these. Uh, uh, I'll, I don't know where I can put these on a website or something, but we'll have those links if you want them. Um, Leo, you were asking on the uh, uh, Aviation Weather Service. Maybe I don't have that one up here. Oh, there it is. NOAA, the Aviation Weather Service, that's where you can find the forecast discussion. It's not a direct link. You'll have to kind of dig through it, but you can find that forecast discussion on there. So, all right. Questions, comments, thoughts? Uh, I mentioned that all those nice bells and whistles that you tended to actually just play with the OR and such and A and B, B. 
getting your head down the cockpit is very dangerous. You got to keep that head on a swivel, no matter what type of equipment you have. Agreed. So it's very important. Yeah. Yes, it is. Yes. Uh, the thing about flight following, remember, it's time available. If you've got the time, yeah. you do it. And they do it anytime they've got the time. Yeah. But that doesn't relieve you of what you're just saying. Because they don't say something that's not, that's not there, they just didn't have an opportunity to tell you. Yeah, yeah. Well, so then it's up to you. Sometimes it's very difficult to get flight following when you're in New York Metropolitan Area. Oh, yeah. I've never done that one. I guess yeah, that's. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it depends how busy. If you can tell the controller is super busy, they're focused on you. On flight following is going to be much less because it's a less of a priority. So if, if they're so busy that you can tell they're getting behind, you might cancel actually at that point because their focus is definitely on something else and not uh, not necessarily on you as a VFR. Yeah. Um, but I will say on the other end, if they are if they're less busy. Some of the good services would be like the restricted areas talking about MOAs around here. We do have uh, training routes, military training mm -hmm. routes. Like you're never going to know that's active yeah. on your own. Um, traffic can be can be good and bad. Um, uh, I know there's some guys out there that'll vector you more than than you would like. Uh, and, and honestly, that's why. <coughs> That's why I don't get flight following on my own sometimes, just because I know who's working in. <laughs> <laughs> Could you share those names or work yeah, names? We have, we have a list. <laughs> yeah. Schedule. <laughs> <Victor guy. laughs> I'm trying to think. But, oh, when I'm when I'm uh, flying, I know I like high reps or looking at high reps as a pilot, but you can't really. If you're not getting flight following, it's much harder to give high reps. So oh, why is that? I mean, well, if you're not, if you're not, not talking, talking to them, yeah. yeah, if you're not talking to them, yeah. you're, you're less likely to just sign on and, yeah. and get give one. Yeah. If you're already talking to them, it's a lot easier. To yeah. Get a what do you like to know in pyrobs? Are you looking for bases or turbulence, or what are the things, the data you're usually looking for? Um, if there's forecast weather, like uh, icing or turbulence, and any report is good, either if there's no turbulence or if there's turbulence. Um, and then certainly adverse weather, so well, any sort yeah. of turbulence, um, icing. Are you interested in turbulence where we fly? I mean, five, six, seven thousand feet, or is that? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Uh, like the flight we just did, we had a bunch of pirates on our route, but they were all on the flight level, so it didn't, you know, it didn't. Yeah. Us any good. Um, and you'll ask us, right? I mean, I've had several controllers say, yeah. hey, what, what are your flight conditions? So you don't have to volunteer the fire rep. They'll ask yeah. you if they need to know what's going on. Yep. Yeah, you guys can ask. Um, let's see. A lot of times another pilot will ask, and we won't have any reports, and that's when we start asking around just to kind of get an idea of what, what's going on in the area. And, you know, it changes over an hour. So if the conditions are bad, we're required to get fire ups. So we have to do that, but if the conditions are fine, we're not regularly getting pyreps when we could use them anyway. So, and I will say some guys sound annoyed, but we put them all in anyway. So, interesting. Yeah. Did anybody use this pyrep? Uh, the app Verga, I think it's called. I've not. It's a. Uh, it's just you know you, you tap in whatever it's an app on your phone for it's giving called, pie reps yeah for oh. pie reps b-i-r-g-a okay look that one up i uh i don't know if they've caught hold yet yeah uh but yeah it's interesting it just, it, the guys, no texting while flying <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I don't know I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here there's uh mentioned windy.com. Tim posted something a week or two ago yep. uh, off his uh, iPad app. Really cool with like you, you had the different sources of information yep. and everything. So I went and downloaded the app 
they changed it. It's I'm pretty technically inclined. It's was this Wendy you're saying? Their app, yeah. their yeah. app, Wendy.com's app now oh. is terrible. See, I've never used it. I've just used them like on the web, just online. Yeah, I find yeah. That they've got a lot of data. I mean, yeah. I like. Yeah. Well, they had, they, they, they had get all data. the models. Yeah, they do. And the old app used to make it very easy to combine the data from all the models yeah. and see them all together. And the big complaint, and if you read the reviews, they updated the app and ruined it basically. Uh, yeah. Uh, I do find, I think, the aviation apps that give you, again, I'll call it an integrated look at all of them over time. To me, that to me is really, because like the Wendy, I say the data is all there, but yeah, it's just, I don't have the brain processing power to kind of yeah. map it all over time and look yeah. at it. So. The old app did that. Ah, nice. <laughs> Bentu Sky is another one. Pardon? Bentu Sky. B-E-N-T-U-S-K-Y. That was the first one I started using. For doing, pi oh, for weather? Yes. Okay, Bentu Sky. Okay. Bentu Sky. Yeah. Is it an aviation specific one or is it? No. Okay. No. Okay. It's, you know, I started looking at it following hurricanes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, but it, it gives you all the, it has the sliders. It, yeah. You know, and you want more, you pay for more. Yeah, that's always but it's okay. Been to, yeah, been to Scott. Okay. Cool. Right. Anything else? Yeah, you mentioned yeah. MOAs. On, on FlightAware, if the MOA is active, it'll be red. It'll oh, really? Be, uh, they'll, they'll, so red. And if it's, you just tap it, yeah. it gives you the altitudes and all that it's stuff. True. It opens, it's opens up a menu. So do you, because you're running a Dynon as well, right? So I mean, yeah. do you see it on your Dynon? No, no. It's yeah. Not yeah. That's why I think some of the tablet-based stuff is better than the EFIS for, for that. Yeah. yeah. If, maybe there's a way to integrate it, but I haven't figured it out. I don't know. And that's what I'm saying. Some of the MOAs I've looked at, you tap on it and get the altitude, but I don't know what the times are. And that's where it used to be on the back legend of the chart, you could get a frequency or times when they were normally active. And so now I, I just ask flight following a lot of times if they're hot. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I agree. I just looked up Virga. It's actually flyverga.com. Okay. And it's got pyreps and you can oh, nice. in, look at them and there's an app. So. All right, flyverga.com. I'm check that one out. Cool. If you ever get a chance to go to Scott, I guess he still has them. I went to him three or four years ago. Uh, he has like two day weather seminars. Yeah. It's, it helps you understand more about what they're for. I'm like you, I don't try to do the forecasting myself, yeah. but it does help understand where they're coming from right. and all that stuff. He is brilliant. He is a brainiac. He is, yeah. 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 It's overload. Is this easy weather report? Is yep. an app? Uh, it's an app. It's, uh, yes, it's an app, but you can also use it on your computer. What does it cost? You know? uh, it's a donation, whatever you think. I think oh, I give, yeah, so it's. Okay. it's I just tried to find it. E, it's no, that's, that's a different app. <laughs> yeah, it's E Z and then W X B. Yeah, but uh, what I think his model right now is you contribute what you think it's worth to you, and that's it. So I, I mean, if you put down too low of amount, maybe you'd say no. I don't know. I've never gotten to know yet. I mean, so yeah, you said you a couple bucks. Yeah. <laughs> it could be. Uh, Brian, you've been using it. Comments on it. You. I used to when I flew over to Indiana. Yeah. When the Taylor crap took a while. Yeah. Uh, but it, it helped me pick a departure time. Yeah. Uh, I, I found to me it's they've been very accurate what he's doing there. I mean it's I was surprised. I called him one time and said, Hey look, your forecast is not matching what they've got at the terminal. He said, Yeah, I said I run my own models. I'm like, okay, it makes wow. sense. Sid one thing I was flying regularly. Yeah. I would look at the trends and see what's doing now and every day check, checking it. Yeah. And you can usually tell what you're going to be running into. That's what that's what I do. Like with the prod charts, look at them day by day? Yeah. Yeah. I do like doing that too. You kind of step through them. Yeah. Yeah. But you, the, one, the thing I don't like on the prod charts is I think when they're taking a picture, I think it's like over six hour span. This is, if you, and so you can see like, rain or thunderstorms over an entire area for like six hours and it may just be a two or three hour slot where it's going to be there if that makes sense it's like a uh, what would you call it a, a culmination of everything that's going to happen over time versus a snapshot and i think to me that was blocking a lot of my flights because you know especially in the southeast right there's going to be thunderstorms almost every day so I, I just need to i need to know what thunderstorms are going to be around between eight and ten in the morning or something yeah so and that, that ads the end the weather just or 
Jordan knows this, but it's, there's a time delay. If you don't pay the subscription, you're looking at about 15 minute hold data. So if you really are looking at, at it, make sure you're not so close to it. That yeah. It's moving along. I still like, I want to be 20, 30 miles away at the closest point. You know, it's nice thing too on the apps, the tablets, or on your EFIS, you can kind of drag your, you know, yourself next to it and say, okay, how far away am I? Which is really nice because I've kind of always stuck in my brain and said, 30 miles away. You know, I don't want to get closer than 30. If there's lightning strike, keep me 30 miles from that. So. I can add to weather is another pretty good benefit from flight falling. You can compare what we're seeing to what your, what your weather MCs. Yeah. Some of us will suggest, like if you ask the controller, like, hey, what would you suggest to get through this? They'll give you something. Some some might not tell you, but yeah. but they'll all give you where, where they're paying the weather for sure, and they can compare what you're, what you're seeing. Same, yeah. Mm -hmm. Nice. Is it real time what you have? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yeah, and generally you're sitting there just staring at it so you can tell what's, what's forming and what's dissipating and what direction it's moving. Like we're, we're staring at that the entire time, whereas you, know, you might be yeah. you're doing other stuff. Texting. Yeah, texting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Yes, sir. This, we find it as a weather, as a web app, but not as a... Not as a downloadable app. app. I've got it on mine. Is a, You have to look through it. I, I find it, again, pretty clunky on here. I don't... You know, if I'm stuck at an airport, I'll use it on here. But it, it's a tablet to me, much better. Yeah, but I can pull it off my phone. There's a, I don't know the right terminology for it, but there's, like, it shows up as an icon on my screen. I can show you here in a minute. And I've touched that. But it's, and it's, I think Brian mentioned, it is, it is if you're going to load a flight like here to Rutherford, it'll be quick. If you load one here to Oshkosh, it's going to sit there and spin circles for 20 or 30 seconds. It's not a super quick thing. And I think it's data hungry as well. Yeah. So. All right. Anything else? Going, going? Going. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, one thing there is a um, fly in and ship a field at Marion on Saturday. You want to go over? It's a nice 3,000 foot. Pool. Well, not quite a pool table. It's, it, it, there's some soft spots in it, but it's grass and it's a nice. Uh, Nice place to go into, and nice people, and they've supported us in the past. We supported them when they started up. We go over to Morristown, we meet them over yeah. there occasionally. So, um, Shepherd Field at Marion on uh, Saturday. Well, if you show up around lunchtime, it'll probably be okay. Burn your own. Cool. Is it like a pancake fly-in or lunch fly-in or just? I don't know what it is really. It's just sort of a fly-in. Uh, okay. But I think they're going to have some food. Uh, uh, it's probably a food truck or something like that. Over there. Cool. Like the skeet shoot, so you want to get there. Oh, is there a skeet shoot? <laughs>